A man here, this is Kenny. Hey, hey there you all are. Welcome and ting and ting and ting, you know what I mean? Uh, this was suggested to me and uh, I know I'm going to pronounce this wrong. I know I am. This one is called uh, the South Armag Sniper, 1997. A-R-M-A-G-H. I know I pronounce it wrong. <laughs> I'll figure it out as the video go along because, you know, I, I never watched these videos before I react to them. I react to them as a, you know, as a vibe up, but uh, it was suggested to me. So, and uh, this was kind of recent too, 1997. Let me, uh, let's go ahead and YouTube and some simmer. And for those who haven't heard of this, will learn something along with me. With the ceasefire shattered, the Brits faced a renewed IRA campaign. In South Armagh, a single shot sniper became the soldier's Amar. deadly nightmare. He'd already killed nine members of the security forces. One had been lucky to survive. His helmet took the force of the high velocity round. I was actually shot through the helmet, grazing the head. Uh, I do remember my neck being taken well and totally back, as well as my whole body. Can you imagine? I mean, I'm from both sides, you know, and I'm not picking, nor am I sympathizing. But can you imagine being a soldier and walking around, patrolling, worried about an attack from an unseen enemy that's just uh, taking headshots at you? But then on the flip side, you've got to think of the person who is doing the shooting. Years of oppression created this sort of amnesty between people. Now, we had like a, a small war back in my country and I don't ever think that I came to the point where I was that afraid or that angry from both sides afraid or angry I just felt nothing because it didn't feel natural for me to be where I was you know what I'm saying I'm supposed to be chilling out, going on the beach, enjoying my life, having fun. But here I am, hiding under a bed in the dark. With man-made stuff to protect myself. It just didn't feel natural. It didn't feel natural that they had to shoot at me or I had to shoot at them. Or possibly shoot at them. Let's get back to this here. I think it's the fact 
fact that you suddenly realise that somebody is there to kill you. You know, you've done so I hate you when you have shots before, but when with it being a sniper, it's one to one. Well, it's not even one to one, and you haven't got the, the chance that he's, he has. But for somebody to pick you up and say, right, you're, you're the one, you're going to die. That's um, been the hardest thing, I think. The five foot long Barrett sniper rifle was mounted in the back of a Mazda and fired from behind a hinged armored plate. Stephen Restoric was unemployed and desperately wanted a job, so he joined the army. He was a typical young 23 year old. He was just so full of life, he, you know, and he was so outgoing as well, you know, he'd, he'd talk to anybody. He knew it was the last thing I wanted him to do, but um, it was his life and he just saw it as a, a good career. In February 1997, Stephen was manning a checkpoint in the village of Bestbrook in South Almar. He was checking a woman's driving license when the sniper squeezed the trigger. And when you heard what had happened? Um, I think it's the usual reaction of anybody who hears the same thing. It's just total disbelief. Slowly, you know, I mean, I just, when the policeman told me, I just said, no, it's not true, it's not true. And, um, you know, from there you have to make the, well, what I would say, the hardest journey anyone have, has to make. Okay, so I'm watching this and it's quite obvious that this is being told from the soldiers, or the British soldiers' perspective. Now, I could have an, an objective view and then look at it from the Irish side too, you know what I'm saying? No, I had somebody comment because uh, I had, in one of my videos, I'd ask during the, the, the farming or the genocide, like they say it is, uh, I was wondering what were the ordinary British people doing? And somebody said, oh, they were eating well and they were doing this and you know what I mean? And uh, don't try to sympathize with them. But that's going to go against everything that I believe. Or that I feel. Because we know that ordinary people usually doesn't have anything to do with stuff that's going on. No, they might, they might follow the rhetoric or the propaganda, but when you live in a country where it's a bombardment of dehumanizing of somebody else, even if you don't really understand it or you really don't mean it, you're going to spew some of that uh, rhetoric out. And I could use myself as an example, you know what I mean? Like a lot of people, I hear them spew anti-immigration stuff and like ordinary people because I work in retail and I work with like ordinary paycheck to paycheck people just like myself. And the one thing I, I, I do, even though they might have a different ideological perspective of life as myself, I try to keep it on the point that, hey, we're not that different. Like, a lot of the times we don't really have control over stuff, you know what I mean? Unfortunately for a majority of people, they just listen to what leaders say. And if... Dissimulation of uh, the dissimulation of in, of information is closely guarded. All you're gonna get is what who is ever in power gives to you, unless you go do research yourself and figure it out. Now, when I do stuff and and a, a, a study stuff, I always want to know what are the ordinary people doing. Because quite frankly, if, you, if you're working paycheck to paycheck and you're struggling to make ends meet, you're not worried about researching to figure out what the other person who is like you in that uh, society, what are they going through? Because, you know, 
leaders were, and, and, and you know, the, the leaders and people in power would say one thing and do another. And sometimes it's not even in the best interest of the people that they say they're doing it for. It's in the best interest of whoever, for themselves and for whoever is going to benefit from what they're doing. And it's not like a big conspiracy theory type thing. This is just the way society's always been. Like, even as a black person, right? When I was growing up, all I saw about Africa was starving children with big bellies and oh, you know, that whole savage image. Until I started doing my own research. And, you know, and I start understanding society and realizing that not everybody in Africa was like that. There was actually places that were peaceful and there were actually places that were relatively prosperous and owned by black people. Another example, after the invasion of my country, I could have just thought, oh, all Americans are evil, they're vicious. And, and then I came here most of these people don't even know where my country is. Shoot, they didn't even know it was happening. I talked to a, a dude the other day at work who didn't even know what happened. He said, well, that happened? I said, yeah, that happened. Doesn't even know. So that's why I always ask, what are the ordinary people doing? Are they for it? Are they against it? Or are they too busy trying to survive? Because not everybody in a society is living good. As a matter of fact, in most societies, most people are living hand to mouth. Trying to make ends meet, always busy, always working to pay attention to what else is going on. Now let's get back to the story. You know, all, all I'm trying to say is, you know what I mean? Yep, this was from a British perspective, but then that was like human beings. And like she said, he couldn't find work, so he joined the military. She didn't want him to. You see, here's the thing. She did not want him to because she probably had an understanding of what could happen to him. And especially in the times when they were living and all the, the, the amnesty going on, most ordinary people don't want to be part of that. They just want to live, love their family, live in some kind of relative peace on both sides. Isn't that how, uh, how the peace Accords and stuff came to happen in Ireland. Uh, the people they said, "Hey, we want some peace, man. This is crazy, you know." And then the politicians had to find a way to bring that peace about. The intelligence agencies had their suspicions as to who the sniper team were. The problem was getting the evidence. Gradually, over long months, 14 intelligence company, the debt, helped build up the picture. You can't stand outside your own base without getting hit by a sniper, and it's uh, pretty poor doings. So, yes, a lot of effort was put into um, capturing the, the sniper teams and finding out who they were. Covert technical surveillance in such a hostile environment was enormously difficult, and the debt's ingenuity was stretched to the limit. You would be picking out things at night in daytime, what you could probably use to disguise the cameras, whether it be an old Wellington boot that lays there, or a rock, a significant rock. You would a get, rock? Yeah. You would photograph the rock with infrared, take it back, uh, and try and replicate that rock as best as you can and replace that rock with a, another one with a camera hidden in it. So the camera is hidden inside inside a rock, yeah. Presumably the operation that you were involved in was replicated all over the place, yeah, all, all across to find out exactly who it was, yeah. So all the suspects were identified, identified, monitored, monitored. movements known, yeah. watched, Recorded, recorded, and acted upon, yeah, as and when required. Intelligence pinpointed a border farm where the team were preparing a shoot. Four IRA men were getting their vehicles ready when the SAS swooped and made the arrest. 
In the search, they found the rifle's lethal ammunition and, in the end, the rifle itself, concealed under the floor of a horse box. We caught them. We caught them red-handed. Uh, we'd struck a blow, the first proper blow, probably for 20 years, against Southern Alpara, who had almost thought they had become invincible. Um, we'd struck right at the heart of their, at the heart of their morale uh, and their feeling of invincibility. Um, it was a great feeling for all the members of the army and for the police because we'd worked a long time, a long time to achieve this. Um, we'd lost a bomber de restric uh, a couple of months before. Um, and we really felt that this was uh, one back for him. It brought about quite a degree of shock on the part of the IRA to be arrested right in their own backyard, so to speak, where they felt a certain degree of relaxation and to find that here they were arrested and their weapons seized. The IRA weren't actually holding weapons at the time of the arrest. Unlike previous allegations of shoot to kill, in this case, no shots were fired. Above all, I think the fact that we had arrested them um, and not shot them, not killed them, not killed them, um, was, I think, very important as well because uh, it sent a message that there weren't going to be any martyrs. Uh, they'd been caught red-handed. Uh, they were going to go down. Uh, that they were no longer invincible. One of those arrested was Seamus McArdle. He wasn't just a member of the sniper team. He was also the elusive triple thumbprint man behind the Docklands bomb. John Greaves' mystery was solved. All right, man, that was quite interesting. Okay, well, this was short but intense. <laughs> oh man, that was a nervous laugh there. That was short but intense. Those are some crazy times for uh, people there. But you know, even in the Caribbean, we heard stories about the IRA and the British occupation. We saw it in the news and stuff. So we knew what was going on there, you know what I mean? And, uh, I did a video about Bloody Sunday, you know, and, uh, and I did the correlation between the island and Grenada. We had our own Bloody Sunday you know, that we call Bloody Sunday on the island. Which in a macabre kind of way means we're not that different. We take stuff from each other all the time. Be it things tragic, uh, name sakes like that, or simple cultural things, you know, like food and all of that. Anyway, man, y'all take care of each other, all right? I'll leave a link in the description to this video. Cool runnings.